Well, Darren Brady here, folks, uh, just with a, another real estate update for 2020, but uh, more particularly, uh, very excited to be able to uh, introduce our guest for our June webinar, and that is Kelvin Davidson. Uh, Kelvin is a senior property economist uh, with CoreLogic New Zealand, uh, and I think uh, some of you would have seen our advert for this webinar. Uh, CoreLogic are simply our uh, industry's preferred supplier of infometrics, um, and so it's it's uh, great that we have uh, Kelvin here to be able to give us an insight into where he sees the post-COVID market going. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, has been a question on everyone's tongue. So uh, firstly, thanks very much for uh, for coming uh, and uh, being our guest speaker today, Kelvin. I'm sure that you would be one of the most sought after speakers uh, out at the moment. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been... Uh I guess there's been quite an appetite for information. We've probably been busier uh, since the start of Alert Level 4 and in and, and the preceding uh, following months than we were prior to lockdown. So it's uh, yeah, sort of ironic that during a period when there hasn't been many property sales, uh, we've been busier than ever. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're always watching the market and, and, and happy to help. So um, yeah, let's get stuck in. Yeah, terrific. Um, Kelvin, I don't think anything necessarily changes in relation to the drivers of the market. So uh, if we can maybe focus on some of those, and uh, we've spoken about immigration uh, when we last spoke, we spoke about uh, the demand factor of the market, which is um, uh, extraordinarily um, vibrant at the moment. Uh, in fact, you could possibly call it overzealous. Uh, the supply being a bit of a concern, we are seeing uh, a reluctance of some, of, some sellers coming to market and then of course the affordability of all of this uh, with interest rates being at such an all-time low and the banks starting to fight for business uh, it just adds everything in the, into the melting pot uh, which makes things even much more confusing for the consumers so let's maybe uh, start with some of those uh, those measures and how you think it might affect the market yeah so I think um, over the next month or two as you said there's some really some really key supports. There's, for a start, let's face it, super low mortgage rates, as low as mortgage rates have ever been. So really great time to, to be a borrower, really, and, and the competition amongst banks is really intense. So those, those super low mortgage rates, I think, are, are, are a key support for the next little while. Um, there's also there's, there's shortages of housing in, in certain parts of the country, which uh, sort of keep, will keep some, some support under prices. Um, as you touched on, affordability. Now, Affordability is a. It always needs to be looked at relatively. I think it's 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 quite hard to say whether this property is affordable or not. It's not so so clear cut as that. But what we can say is that affordability is better than it was in the past. And mm -hmm. certainly around Auckland, um, there has been an improvement in affordability over the last year or two as as prices have stabilised and incomes have risen, mortgage rates have fallen. So. Uh, as I say, it's, it's hard to say whether something's affordable or not, but it's certainly more affordable than it was a couple of years ago and, and prior to that too. So affordability is looking a bit better than it has been. And um, yeah, so those, those drivers are just really, really looking quite positive, as well as the migration point you touched on. A lot of discussion about that and how what that might do, whether it'll fall away to zero. And I think there is there's probably been a little bit too much pessimism about that because remember there's estimated to be as, ma as many as a million New Zealanders living overseas mm. who may, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're all going to come home, but, but some of them will. And that's a good chunk of people overseas that may now choose to come back to New Zealand with some capital potentially and, and looking to, to buy into the property market. So there is, um, I think there's, there's reason to think that net migration could actually be a bigger driver than, than what a lot of people are thinking. So, so yeah, in that, in that sort of next month or two, two or three months, it, it's, definitely looking, it's definitely looking relatively buoyant. We've seen some pent up demand come through. Uh, listings are still pretty tight. It's, it's, it's hard to get those listings coming through. So um, I think it, it's not looking too bad. The, the question for me is, is what happens uh, sort of in spring and as we get towards the end of the year as some of some of the government support measures wear off uh, you do get that seasonal rise and listings potentially coming through then that for me is is, is the crunch point 
Yeah, fantastic. Look, great and interesting points are very relevant at the moment. And one thing that we are seeing uh, come through from some of our portals, uh, such as realestate.co and, and Trade Me One Roof, uh, is that we're getting a huge amount of uh, connectivity from overseas. So, uh, you know, you say that there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of expats overseas, uh, but we are seeing uh, that there is a definite uh, lift in inquiry from overseas. And I think that that's come from uh, the way that we've handled our COVID situation, uh, the way that the Prime Minister has certainly driven uh, the um, our clean, green image again and put us back on uh, the uh, the map in relation to a place that really people want to uh, to live. So uh, do you think something like that might just help with that, that immigration possibility? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's pretty staggering really when you think about we're, we're probably in a position now to, to move to level one next week and mm. uh, that'll just put us ahead of you know, pretty much everywhere else around the world. So yeah, it might've been tough during lockdown, but look at the benefits we're, we're reaping now. So it is, uh, you know, if you take a step back, it is, it is pretty staggering. And I think that will be a draw card. For me, the, the sort of caveat to all that is, is, is people are only gonna come back, I guess, if they're reasonably confident about getting a job. So a lot still hinges on that, that labor market outlook. But I guess if you think about the, the nuts and bolts of that, the, the segments of the economy that are the most vulnerable, which are, you know, as we all know, sort of tourism for a start, and, and I guess the hospitality business is tied up with, with that, that sector. Um, that's where a lot of the job losses will be concentrated and where, where, where some of the pain's gonna be felt. But you know, you would think for the most part that, in, that a lot of New Zealanders potentially coming back would actually be looking for jobs in other sectors. It's, it's going to be professional services or engineering or these types of things. So perhaps parts of the economy that won't be so badly affected. So that, that, uh, that caveat that a lot of the pull will depend on the labour market, well, might not be so much to be concerned about because the sectors they're going to look to come back into are ones that should hold up okay. So, yeah, I think um, I think it is the, the fact that we're going to be probably, hopefully, moving to level one shortly. We've got a we've gone through this pretty well, and 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 the sectors that people might be looking to come back to are the ones that shouldn't be so badly affected. I think it's all it all sort of comes together for a relatively encouraging story. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we uh, we're obviously in that uh, in that immigration. We spoke about employment, and we do understand that you know the government's doing a great job in being able to subsidise things at the moment and keep things fluid in relation to employment and wages and what have you. Uh, and we understand that that will have to come to an end, uh, and that will have some form of effect on job losses. We understand that. I'm just wondering, from your point of view, and some of the uh, the marks that you've been looking at, have you seen uh, any evidence of those investors coming back? to the market as we now are seeing and maybe taking um, a little of the first homeowners market that we know will be affected whilst uh, uh, those jobs are obviously a concern. Yeah, it's it's early days. So we've, we've got a, a really comprehensive series we call buy classification that looks at, breaks, breaks down all the transactions into who's been purchasing. Uh, and certainly prior to lockdown, uh, mortgaged investors had been taking a rising share of the market. And I guess where there was a bit of, it's a, apparently seemingly a, a bit of heat, bit of competition going on uh, amongst first home or between first home buyers and, and mortgaged investors. They were kind of the marginal buyer, the ones providing that momentum. And, yes. and it was your smaller investors. It was the, the mums and dads who, who were perhaps buying their first rental or their second or third rental with, with smaller portfolios. That was certainly the momentum provider pre-lockdown. It's early days to know exactly what's been going on in terms of hard data since lockdown and in, in level three and two. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hear anecdotally that, that certainly there's, there's a lot of inquiry coming in from investors who are still in the game, still see the appeal of property, are um, you know, looking forward to, to low interest rates. Of course, the, the LVR rules as well have been relaxed. So can potentially get in now with, with smaller deposits than previously. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, and turn deposit rates as well, are, are, you know, remaining pretty low. So there, there are a lot of incentives to, to be in the property market. And, and that's certainly what we hear, that there is that level of inquiry coming through from investors. Still, still inquiry from first time buyers as well. So um, you know, there was a bit of a hit to those Kiwi saver deposits initially, of course, but, but it's actually come back quite well and those deposits are probably looking a bit better than, than what people were thinking so 
Yeah, there's there's still, as I said, I think there is this period for two or three months where where buy demand is going to look look pretty good, and um, part of that coming coming from investors for those those reasons I mentioned. Uh, terrific. Uh, uh, look, just for for those of you who are watching, and uh, I know that there are many there, I failed to obviously uh, uh, mention that uh, we'll give you the opportunity of being able to answer any questions. So please message those questions through, and uh, Kelvin would be uh, delighted to obviously answer those uh, directly to you uh, uh, after the podcast. Um, so obviously, with that affordability, and we spoke about uh, the different buyers, uh, buyer groups being active, uh, and potentially maybe a balancing out of the first homeowners with the uh, uh, the investors coming through. I note that there has been uh, certainly a lift in activity around investors seeking the likes of uh, neutral and positively geared property. And you mentioned that before with obviously prices stabilising, interest rates coming down and income going up. Uh, that certainly adds to uh, a nice flavour in relation to uh, uh, making it more of a an investor's market that uh, that they may, be, uh, may want to come in and, uh, and act upon. So that's that's great. Uh, obviously, um, we're experiencing uh, a great demand for our properties at, at the moment. You did mention that it potentially could be that pent-up demand. Um, we headed our uh, conversation or, or our webinar uh, today, uh, could this be the new norm? Uh, and uh, I know we spoke just a little earlier off, uh, uh, off uh, camera and uh, talking about uh, what will be that new norm. And there are so, uh, so many uh, um, bits of data that are coming through, albeit slowly, uh, we made mention uh, earlier that um, uh, it is hard to get an understanding of, and uh, maybe form some form of predictability out of uh, out of the market. Uh, that's uh, one that I'm going to throw over to you. Uh, a little bit of crystal ball gazing now, and I know that that's uh, that's something that you don't like to talk about. It's all factual matters, uh, and uh, but with the. Um, uh, the fact we haven't got a lot of data there, uh, you have done some other data that has certainly replaced uh, that current sales data. So maybe if we could touch a little on that, uh, Kelvin, that'd be great. Yeah. So first, I guess on those on those near term indicators, we we through our real estate platforms, and we we can monitor uh, uh, appraisals um, generated by real estate agents, and they they fell away a lot during lockdown, but have really really come back strongly uh, post lockdown. So and actually not far off. So the rebound's been so strong that those appraisals generated now aren't too far off where they were pre-lockdown. So actually, you know, activity has come back pretty well. We've seen uh, banks, the, the volume of valuations being ordered by banks through our platforms has, has picked up a lot as well. So, you know, it does, it all just adds to this, this these early signs of, of a reasonably decent return to the, to the market and, and activity picking up. Of course, those things will then lead through to, to listings and lead through to agreed sales and so I think the near-term outlook isn't isn't too bad. I guess what I'd also like to make clear though is that let's let's face it we are in a we are in a very uncertain economic time and, and, and there's, there's going to be some pain ahead so I think we, we do need to look to that that time later in the year when when maybe some of these factors are wearing off the wage subsidy and the mortgage payment deferrals uh, and you know we do get a, a bit of a rise in listings in spring with that seasonal pattern, and I think that is a time we, that we do need to watch. There is going to be some pain, and I think for the for the year as a whole, just based on some of these macroeconomic indicators that we watch around GDP and the unemployment rate, uh, actually it does look like sales volumes will be down this year. There's I don't think there's too much um, sort of debate about that, and and we're kind of looking at a even a, as much as a 20% fall in, in activity for, 20, for the 2020 as a whole compared to 2019. So it will take us back down to levels of activity that, that were similar to the, to the GFC. So we're talking about a, a relatively quiet market in terms of turnover. Um, in terms of prices, there's, there's forecasts out there of you know, 15 to 20% falls in terms of average property prices. I think for me, that's, that's a little bit pessimistic. Um, in the GFC, Prices on average fell about ten percent, and I think there's reasons why the falls. I think there probably will be falls, but I think there's there's reasons why those falls uh, could be smaller than ten percent. And we've we've touched on the factors already that affordability is better, mortgage rates are lower, there's shortages of housing. But a key factor for me is is and a big difference is that in the GFC, you know, the banks were sort of at the heart of that and having to look at their own balance sheets and really tighten up on, on lending activity to, to shore up their position. Because this time now, 
the banks are well capitalized. We've, we've seen a lot of commentary from the Reserve Bank about the resilience of our financial system and, and banks have money to lend. It's, it's all there, provided that people can um, you know, satisfy the income and expense testing, uh, have, have some kind of you know, awareness of, of the LVRs and, and putting in some kind of deposit. The money is there. And um, so it, it's not as if credit, it's, this isn't a credit crunch scenario like it was back in the GFC. So I think that, that's a big difference for me. And the banks are actually, you know, in a, playing a supporting role this time with, with payment deferrals and all these other initiatives. So I think for that reason, if you're looking at the GFC as a kind of benchmark when, when prices fell 10%, I think the falls um, could be smaller this time, you know, in the range of sort of 5 to 7%. So, so that's, um, that's kind of weird. That's our wearing assumption. That's, that's what we're thinking. Uh, could be the out, could be the upturn for for twenty twenty as a whole. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's some great uh, great information. Uh, similar similarly, we act on the same information, so we probably uh, we're at the pointier end of that, and you're at the collection end of uh, of that data. And we're certainly experiencing that, and we believe that that uh, similarly it will be roughly around that five to seven percent. I want to touch uh, on your thoughts around the differences between the main centres and the regions. Uh, do you think that there's going to be uh, you know a greater impact in the regions uh, that uh, similar to what we did see in the uh, uh, in the GFC, uh, uh, and also, um, when do you think we can get some relatively consistent data, um, and data enough that you could almost start to cement uh, uh, some sort of predictability? Yeah, so I think touching on the regions versus the main centres, uh, I don't have a, a firm view on that necessarily. There's a lots of lots of factors pushing in, in, in lots of directions. I think we will. I mean, thinking about the tourism industry and it taking the biggest hit well you know a lot of the activity in that sector does tend to be in the provinces and in the regions you know your, your Queenstowns and and um, Fiordland and you know around Rotorua, Taupo so these are sort of outside the the main centres um, so there will be a hit to property markets in those areas um, but even the main centres you know there is exposure to international tourism a lot of a lot of international tourism arriving into Auckland and arriving into Christchurch, so there is going to be an effect from that. Um, but I think, I think on average, I, I suspect that you know regional property markets could be hit a little bit harder than than the main cities for those just because of those economic factors. So, so that would be that would be the sort of rough steer on that one. Yeah. Uh, and sorry, I've now forgotten the second part of the question. <laughs> what just, uh, just necessarily looking around um, a timing of, uh, of data collection that might then give us some more uh, of an insight into predictability, um, trends and what have you. Yeah, I think uh, probably, I mean, let's face it, the next, so the, I think there will be some decent activity for the next couple of months, but we are going into winter. We, we, I mean, we're already in winter, looking out my window at the moment. And, and so when, when volumes are relatively thin, it's always a little bit a little bit risky making firm conclusions. So I, I think for that reason, adding on top of all those other ones, I think spring's the, the real time when when things will become clearer. So I think once we get into I'm I'm thinking around August, we'll have a good we'll have a good flow of data by then um, from the from the lockdown period and as we've moved back down through the alert levels. We'll be starting to see a few more listings potentially coming on as we get to sort of August, September. Some of the, the economic measures will have either worn off or, or, or have been bulked up. Um, so, so I think yeah, that, that that sort of August, September period will be what, what I'm what I'm looking for. The other the other thing that we need to acknowledge, of course, is we've got an election coming up. So, uh, you know, elections are uncertainty generating, unfortunately, and and so. That will uh, be an additional factor to watch for uh, towards the end, of the end of the year, particularly if um, you know if the polls start to swing around and uh, you know national can can sort of up their game a little bit and create create a bit more of uh, a competition for that that political race. It, it will uh, it'll, it'll get pretty interesting around then, and you know whether it's, it's it's always hard to know. Business confidence is a big drag on on the economy at present, and whether there is this perception that businesses react better to a, a national government than a Labour government. So, you know, how all that plays out, I think, think could have a large bearing as well. But I think it all just adds to the case that, that sort of August, September is, is the period when we, we should get a really clear view on things.
Terrific, thank you. Now, that's really good information and something there that we should uh, uh, look at maybe touching on. Um, we've always been of the opinion uh, that uh, real estate is a long-term investment. And uh, I don't believe, and I'm sure that you would agree, that there's no need at this point when you're now saying to us that um, there's no concrete evidence until maybe later in the year, or even uh, looking at spring and coming into um, uh, to post-2020, uh, uh, the need to make any rash decisions. Um, uh, we're certainly informing our clients and customers that um, uh, everything seems to be going along, even though we've had an extraordinary time of dealing with what COVID has thrown at us. Uh, the market is still performing well. We're still collecting uh, our rents. Uh, our arrears are certainly at a, a managed uh, level. Um, so there is no need to, uh, to go out and um, throw the baby out with the bathwater and, uh, and sell. Uh, so that's been what we've been saying. So I'm probably now posing the same sort of question. Um, uh, is that long-term view in real estate still very much relevant today? Yeah, I think it is. But certainly, from what we everybody we talk to, there's still a there's still a strong appetite there. The appeal of property as a, a long term asset class hasn't changed, and um, there you know it's still the the Kiwi perception is, is that property is a good way to go. And, and I think that's right. If if you look at just look at it, I mean, what else are you going to do? What are the alternatives? You look at you know, turn deposit rates really low. Um, there is this perception rightly or wrongly that that the share market's uh, a riskier place to be and I guess the recent gyrations in shares have, have probably only reinforced that even though they've come back up now uh, you know the, the the ups and downs uh, do tend to put people off um, you know syndicated sort of commercial property funds have maybe had a few problems lately as well and, and people are going to be a little bit wary of commercial property with with the discussions around you know, are tenants actually going to pay the rent and is there going to be more working from home? Do we need as much office space as we once had? How's retailing going to be affected by this? So so there is, there's suspicions around all of these other asset classes that people might be looking to get into. Um, with, with, with the old thing that you can, of course, uh, you know, you can borrow, you can, you can leverage up to get into property. Um, and so with, with, with mortgage rates, you know, with super low mortgage rates. So a lot of those fundamental drivers that, that have always been there, I think, are, are remaining in place. They haven't changed yet. You might want to, timing matters and, uh, you know, nobody wants to be sort of buying into a falling market, but it's all, it's always hard to, I mean, who, who knows? You only know in hindsight, really, whether you, you bought into a market at the, at the best time. And if you are holding for the long run, then, you know, you'll do okay. So and, and picking, Picking the trough is, is always hard, and, and um, so that that long term hold is, is is always going to make sense. So so yeah, I don't think the I don't think the fundamentals really have changed. Yes, it's going to be a tricky period to get through, and, and people are going to be looking at the sums and, and thinking, well, should I buy now or should I buy later? But but that's always there, you know. And and, and the long term appeal for me is is definitely there still. That's uh, and really uh, great information, and, uh, and you went uh, in depth there. We've we've actually been uh, securing a number of uh, uh, first time investors into our market now, seeing that we do have the ability of being able to offer that positive gearing, that healthy return, uh, and uh, so we've been uh, inviting new uh, new players into our market. Uh, and I'm sure now that the uh, the mums and dads and the rank and file investors uh, are now starting to come through. Uh, so. I think that that's also a, a sign of that confidence uh, that things will return. I suppose one thing we do have is we have history on our side, and that is that the, there is always uh, that robustness to the market, and it does return. Uh, now I'm going to now throw the um, the hot potato at you. That last uh, question, uh, crystal ball gazing. What's 2021 uh, got in store for us, whether it be um, early or late? Well, I think I, I can. Uh, we approach these things from the, the sort of top-down macroeconomics perspective, I guess, and and indications at the moment are that you know, this will be a a relatively short-lived thing. There's a short, sharp shock, and we we have things flowing through really quickly to the unemployment rate and really quickly to to GDP, and and then actually 2021 starts to starts to move in the more positive direction. You start to see unemployment coming back down again. You start to see GDP improving. So I think we have to, at this point, work on the assumption that that 
yep, 2020 is a tough, a tough year and we're going to see volumes down a bit and we're going to see um, sale, um, property prices down a bit. But actually, as, as, as the economy starts to improve again next year, we may see that, you know, that trans-Tasman bubble and, and perhaps even expanding out to other countries as well. So I think you have to assume that 2021 looks a bit better economically than, than 2020. And so therefore, that will throw, flow through to the property market. And so I think you'll, you'll see a, an improvement in volumes again next year and, and perhaps some of those price falls that we're, we're likely to see this year starting to reverse. So, um, yeah, in terms of, uh, it's not financial advice or anything, but in terms of, of, you know, what's the best time to buy? Well, we may well look back and say that, that you know, later in 2020 was, was a good time and, and um, yeah, the market then started to pick up again in 2021. Not saying it's going to be racing, racing away or, you know, roaring off to the sky or anything. There's still, there's still going to be some restraints. So let's face it, we're going to have to pay for all this borrowing at some point. The government debt's rising and that may well mean in the future that the tax rises are on the cards and that will sort of slow the economy relative to where it might have otherwise been um, so this is a it's not just just because we've had a short sharp shock on the downside doesn't mean it's all going to be automatically fixed straight away it might be a little bit of a slow grind but i think you know, 2021 should look a bit better and um so you know we may well look back and say that that, that 2020 was was actually later on in the year perhaps uh or in early 2021 was was the time to buy. Yeah, terrific. Look, uh, that's a wonderful insight, Kelvin, and uh, we thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's uh, obviously a, uh, a very delicate um, uh, thing that we hold very near and dear to our heart, real estate. Uh, we've seen everyone and uh, and their dog uh, offering commentary. So it's great to be able to come to uh, to experts like yourself, the people who actually look at the data, but also uh, live in the in real time. Uh, so you've assessed where we're at, where we could be, and where you think we will be. And I think that that's been a very clear. Uh, there's been a lot of crystal clear uh, vision around that, and I think that's going to be a, a great position of which then people can uh, can use to move forward and make some really informed decisions. Uh, so we've uh, we've had a number of questions throughout uh, today's um, uh, webinar. We'll get back to you, obviously, and, uh, and answer those. Uh, the one thing we can say at the moment, uh, that the market is alive and well. Um, people still need houses. Uh, uh, the rental market is very strong, and we're getting uh, loads of applications through uh, from uh, our tenants. And we are now, just as the lockdown has finished, seeing people starting to move now uh, but uh, all in all I think uh, everything seems to be very healthy and onwards and upwards uh, for a positive finish to 2020 and a great start to 2021 so uh, on behalf of Harvey's and, uh, and all of our customers and clients we thank you very much for taking the time to come out and, uh, and give us this wonderful insight and we look forward to hope, hopefully having you on as a uh, guest in the near future at another one of our Harvey's webinars. Uh, thanks very much Kelvin Davidson.